afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone to this pre-event session for the Glam Hack 2021 and want to go straight into sharing my screen with you all so that does this work? Do you all see the presentation? Um, wonderful. So my name is Darian. I am from Open Data, and it's my greatest pleasure and honor to welcome everyone and also especially the speakers of the day. Uh, this is the pre-event for Before the Hack, which starts tomorrow, and we're going to dive right into it. Uh, what we're going to do today is just have a quick look at the rules again at the program. We are going to have as well a panel talk. The evening doesn't just end yet with the slam poetry performance by Lisa Chris, because in the evening there's also a Lodepa workshop uh, if you want to join. So the rules are very simple. Please just mute yourself at all times unless you're speaking or you have a question. You can raise your hand by going to the emojis down in the in your uh, Zoom and you can see uh, reactions and you can like raise your hand so we know you wanna say something. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask them directly in the Zoom chat or on the Slack channel. If you haven't signed up yet on the Slack channel, please let us know so we can send you the link as well. And if you can't contact us either via Zoom or via Slack, there's always the email address where you can contact us. So. This as well as an option. And if you have any feedback regarding the event or regarding the program or anything, you can always, uh, we're very, very thankful for any kind of feedback. So we're starting uh, with a presentation on the Open Museum project uh, by Maya and Selena. We continue with the project graph. Later at four, we start with um, the, a talk on object recognition. At 4.30, we have um, a talk on getting started with IIIF. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Then we have a short break. And then we have the panel discussion with uh, Beat Estaman, Matthias Bernhard, Leonel Walter, and Michael Gasser. And at six o'clock, there is a spoken word performance by Lisa Christ. And then there's a short break and we have then the Lodepa Hackathon Workshop. And I am gonna just continue without further ado. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Selena Stuber and Maya Schr I'm probably saying it wrong, uh, who say that they have extremely similar backgrounds they, and interests. They both have studied history, both have worked in museums, and both are training to become a teacher, and both love long kitchen evenings with loud music. They also founded an online museum together, the Opium Museum. You can see the link on the slide here. And they also said to make the distinction simple because they're together on the screen. Selena is the one with the short hair and Maya what, the one with the long hair. And I'm gonna give the screen over to them. Welcome Hello. everyone. <laughs> Hello everybody. Hello. So we would start to share our screen with you. Just a second. So, do you see our our screen? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we would like to welcome you to the pre presentation of our digital museum, the Open Museum, and are very happy to present it at this year's Glam Hack. Like Darian said, my name is Maya, and I will tell you a little bit about the context and the product museum, product Open Museum, and then um, I will briefly guide you through the Open Museum. Then Selena will show you our collection database and tell you about the chances and challenges of our product and raise some further questions. So the Open Museum was created within 48 hours as part of last year's hackathon, the Versus Virus, um, during the first lockdown. And as the name implies, the motto of the hackathon was to build inclusive solutions together against the COVID-19 crisis. So the hackathon challenges were located in different thematic areas, and our project was dedicated to the topic art and culture. 
So we implemented the Open Museum in a team of eight people. And uh, later before I saw that one of our team members is also watching this presentation, Henrique Hoffmann, hi. <laughs> and yeah, the team members had or have different skills and backgrounds and were so assigned to the following tasks like research, editing, graphic design, UX design, front end and back end. Selena and me took over the project management as we both have experience in museum work. So uh, during the first lockdown, the museums were closed and having this in mind and with our professional background, we came up, up with the idea of a virtual museum. So we focused on the following questions. First, how can we gather new impressions from home? And second, how can we discover art and culture together with friends? So we came up with the idea of the Open Museum, a digital museum that allows the visitors to communicate. So the Open Museum is an independent digital museum on the topic Spanish flu. And as you will see in a moment, it can be visited individually or in a group. Um, one can browse the different contents in the digital museum rooms or also on our collection database. So we wanted to simulate a virtual visit where the visitors have to find their own path through the museum and the different rooms. And uh, visitors have to make decisions and can in this way discover different topics in a playful way. Uh, another aspect is that the visitors are connected via audio chat and can exchange on this way their experiences. This was an important aspect for us. So we wanted to create the possibility for the visitors to communicate with other visitors in our virtual museum. Um, and now I would like to show you our product. So this is the welcome page. And now I can choose a one person entry or a group entry. If I would like, if I would choose a group entry, it would generate a link and I can share this link with other members. So we are connected in one audio chat. And if I go in um, a one person entry, I'm like in the general audio chat and I'm, I'm connected with other visitors. So I will go as one person. And now there's a pr problem with my um, audio chat. Now I can go further without the chat or I can try again and hope we can get started now. So now I'm in the museum. I'm connected with the audio chat. So if another person would be also on this page, he or she would hear me. So because of this, I will <laughs> mute uh, on this button, the audio chat and go further. So this is um, the first room. Um, it's like an introduction to the topic Spanish flu. Uh, we, choose this, we chose this topic because we wanted to give a historical view on the, um, on the, on the pandemic. And yes, so we gathered some content on this um, topic and presented it here in the museum. So now I can navigate through the museum if I click on these buttons. Like you see, it will like pop enlarge a little bit. Um, oh. So yeah, like this. So I can go up, down, and right, left. And the icons on the navigation are also the icons on the represent the room. So if I go here on the paper, I, I'm here in the museum's room on paper. So there's not also a text. We also have pictures and we can enlarge them and also close the windows. Um, here are the copyrights. Yes. And we have one special thing in our museum. That's a little game our programmers made. It's this rocket. So I'm the rocket here. And I can start the game and shoot some viruses. Yeah, I'm not good at this. Uh, okay. Um, one other thing uh, we have here is our map. This is this question mark. So I can go here on the map and I see here the whole museum. And it's not the idea that I can click on these icons and 
and hop on the different rooms, I have to navigate through all the rooms like in a real museum. I can't jump, which is I have to navigate through. If I want to go, for example, here, I have to go every, every way back and then down here. Um, and yes, then we have here our logo. And it's, this is like the about side. And here are all the, the team members or the people who, who uh, worked on the project, um, contact side and impress them. And also here's a link to our data collection base that Selena will show you. So hello everybody. Um, in addition to our open museum, we also created this, this page with our um, collection database. Um, it was like, I can show you directly here, you get to the, the collection. And here we assembled like all the, the, the pictures or the sources that we found under the, the, the topic. And so you can like, browse um, through our collection and then you find like all the, the information, like the information we also have in the Open Museum, the title, the text, but also like more information on the source and the copyright. And this was like also important for us like during the hackathon because like we already used this database to, um, to like make or bring some order in our sources. And another idea that we had is um, it's also possible to contribute something um, to this database. So we had an idea if like some visitors like knew from like a picture or something, then they can like contribute this content to our database. And there's also like this small um, section on like where to find public domain content. Um, so we go back to our presentation. Sorry, just a second. <laughs> so here we go. Um, and I'm going to talk to you um, a bit about open source and our technical solutions. Um, the Open Museum is built on the two aspects, open source and open access. And this was also like kind of our biggest challenge. Um, the content used in the Open Museum, so all the pictures or like pictures from journals, um, all the objects that you see are in public domain. And so this is like just what I showed you on the database. There's all the information on the copyright. And the name of our museum is also like inspired um, by these aspects. And it was crucial to us to show public domain content. Um, we are convinced that knowledge and cultural testimonies should be made increasingly accessible to a broad pu uh, public. And we know that there exist like so many collections in different archives that are hardly ever made accessible for the public. And in addition, during the hackathon, we quickly realized that we would um, have to limit the sources to public domain because we, we simply didn't have time during this weekend to clarify the rights. And it was really hard or difficult to find interesting sources to show in our museum. And even though the Spanish flu happened more than 100 years ago, there are not a lot of materials in the public domain, and especially Swiss um, like content. For the United States, for example, we find quite a lot of uh, a lot of photographs, but not um, for Switzerland. And I think this aspect is also like you can see that in the museum. There's like a lot of text sources, and we didn't, do not have a lot of like colorful sources. And uh, since it was always the idea to not only like show text and information about this topic, but also like these these images we um, depended heavily um, on these public domain sources. And even though it was like our self-imposed rule, it limited us quite a bit. 
and uh, some uh, technical information um, for our database. Um, we used uh, Omega S, and this is uh, like a free and flexible um, open source web publishing platform, and that can be used like or is used in like libraries, museum, and archives. And for the front end, back end, and also the audio chat, we all uh, we use the open source software. And the technical implementation was also a big challenge, which um, Maya and I were not <laughs> experts in this area. Um, but our two programmers had a hard time, um, like to find a solution for the audio chat, like that it was like really work. And um, they invested a lot of time in this, um, yeah, to find solutions for for the technical, um, our technical problems. And uh, now I quickly want to talk about a few key points that define the Open Museum. Um, for us, it was like a very enriching experience to implement such a project um, independent of an organization or a sponsor. And this way we were able to implement our ideas and try out what is possible in such a short time. And it was really a positive experience to see like how much you can get done during this 48 hours. And we had the vision to provide knowledge about the Spanish flu. Um, so it was important to like give this information, but at the same time we wanted to do this in a playful way. And it was important to us that visiting the online, online museum is fun. And so, it's because of this that we chose like also the design with uh, these different like um, playful elements, but also like that you that you have to discover your way. It's not just um, a chronological or like linear um, walk through the museum, but you can like really make your own decisions and choose which rooms you want to see. And like another uh, important um, aspect is the the interaction, the audio chat enables you like to visit the museum with a group of friends even if those friends are like each or individually at home but like this you can connect and talk about uh, the information you find in the museum and a very important factor and i think a huge um, potential of the open museum is its replayable framework um, this means that the technical solution that we found allows us to realize exhibition on different topics. So we can like change the content um, if we want to and just like create uh, another um, exhibition. And the uh, Open Museum has a very easy access. Um, it's easy to use and uh, it's free. So our hope was to reach out to a different audience and an audience that perhaps does not um, really go to museums, um, but like there maybe the Open Museum can, can offer an exciting opportunity. So I already come like to, to the last page in our presentation and want to talk about like a few important questions or points um, for the future. Um, like when we finished the exhibition on the Spanish flu, we thought that we would like immediately start another or like work on another exhibition. But um, unfortunately, uh, we did not have the capacity to work on further exhibitions because um, of our, our jobs. Um, but however, it is our wish and goal to be able to realize further digital exhibitions and we're like really open on, on the topics. We also talked about um, like art exhibitions. So we yeah, we really want to realize other exhibitions. And the, I already talked a little bit about the, about the open contribution. This is something that I think could be um, like there, that was not like used very much during the like for this Spanish flu exhibition, but I think it's a I still like the idea about the visitors being able to contribute um, to um, uh, an exhibition. And 
then we also uh, thought about the possibility of translation into further languages. This is um, a point that we're still uh, thinking about. And furthermore, um, like one of the most important points maybe for us is the, the possibility of collaborations. And it would be a great experience to be able to present the collection um, of sources in our online museum and provide information about the new topic. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of potential like to work with an archive or an institution and, and show um, existing collection. And uh, it would also be like possible to expand the functions of the Open Museum because now you can like, it's quite uh, limited what you can do, like you can enlarge a picture, you can close it again, you can uh, find your own way through the museum, but there's a lot of potential to for like other solutions. And we have also uh, thought about the possibility of the Open Museum being used in schools. Uh, we have colleagues uh, who have reported integrating the Open Museum into their lessons to give students an initial overview of the Spanish flu. And we have the idea, or we would like um, yeah, to realize this idea um, to like, um, that the students themselves could realize their own exhibition, like do research, write texts, and yeah, do their own um, exhibition in this framework. And for us, it was like really interesting to think about the chances, but also the, the restrictions of a digital museum. And uh, I think the pan pandemic has fueled the development of such digital solutions. And it keeps being interesting to think like about this new form of knowledge uh, or art transfer. So we're like at the end of our presentation. And um, we would love to discuss um, with you like what ideas you have or like your feedback. Thank you so much, Maya and Selina. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions or a discussion in the group. Please just, uh, ah, Ariana, go ahead and mute yourself. Shall I? I can't unmute you. Maybe she didn't want to say anything. You can raise your hand either with uh, reactions or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself right now. Um, thanks a lot from my side for the presentation as well. I think it was great and also a great example of what you can actually do within, um, what was that, 48 hours. Um, I was wondering, could you say a little bit more about the interaction that actually took place? You said it didn't work so well, but um, I mean, did people actually interact, use this um, audio chat function or things like that? Or did you also get um, extra content from other institutions? Did that kind of work out some way? Um, I think the interaction with the audio chat, that is something that worked. Like we were firstly, we weren't sure if the people would like the idea of like talking or like being heard or hearing someone else, but this was not at all a problem. I think people thought it was funny to like be in such a digital, like on, in such a space and like hear someone else. So you're not like alone in front of your um, computer. Um, but for the uh, contribution, we did only like receive in the beginning a few like information or sources. Um, and I guess for the like collaboration, um, I guess we would like there we would have like to interact with the um, archives or like contact them directly. We're taking questions from the audience. <laughs> do you, I mean, I was wondering, do you have already like an idea what you would like to do next? Because you said you want to do a next exhibition and do you already have like a bit more of a concrete idea what you would like to do? 
Um, yeah, like Selena told, we had the idea like doing an art exhibition. It would be nice because we are like historian, but it would also be nice to to have like some content from artists. Um, it can be also like art that was produced during this time <laughs> um, to stay like in this topic of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but also the idea um, bringing the Open Museum into schools. Like if a teacher has time and wants to do a project with, with, the, uh, with the students that they can like realize their own exhibition. And we would like help them uh, with the research and editing, but the contents would come from the students. That would be uh, like a nice idea or to try this in school, if it would like go more. I see that Saro, I think is giving you a compliment in the chat, if I'm not wrong. He's saying that he liked the idea of the four pathways in each direction of the screen. <laughs> Thank but you. Thank you very much. <laughs> obviously, compliments are also welcome to be said in the, in the group. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, when, when you said art, I thought, okay, what kind of art? That's why I was wondering if you have a more specific idea. I think uh, it's also interesting to see what kind of art was produced during the pandemic. Joyful, lively, free. <laughs> and I think like it would, what I think would be interesting, like if you can show a picture like art, an artwork, like in the middle, and then you have like the possibilities on like on the left and the right and yeah, like in the other rooms to, for example, the artist could talk about the process or like how they worked on it. So I imagine like not only the presentation of art, but also like the, um, that we can like get insight on, on the work of the artist. Yeah. It's really nice. Uh, I was wondering, are you in contact with the uh, Corona memory people? I think they might be interested in um, using this kind of open museum as well. I don't know, just as an add-on to the Spanish flu. Yes, we were like, we were in contact and then it was really like just a problem because of our jobs, because we both okay. like, were 100%, yeah. so we were like not able. Yeah, yeah we, I can see that, like, okay. Kind of do it, but yeah, we, it would have been like the perfect <laughs> get together. <Match. laughs> Yes, okay. This is maybe a bit of a small question, but are you participating in the hack tomorrow? No. No, unfortunately no. not. No. Okay. <laughs> but that would be something you could be suggesting as a challenge, for instance, for the for the hackathon, and then, uh, I mean, just spontaneously, I, I say like maybe you could find a team during the hackathon and they work with you off the hackathon as a spin-off project. That's just an idea right now coming. Yeah, that's a good idea because um, it's like we ourselves we kind of like <laughs> realize just another exhibition by ourselves, like we like for a normal like exhibition, we also you would use like someone who does like the programming mm -hmm. and the design and, like there's, yeah, we mm -hmm. would need a team. So, yeah. yeah. Can be suggested as a challenge. Definitely, we can uh, have a look at it tomorrow. So it is actually time for the next presentation. Thank you so much, Maya and Selena. Uh, for your presentation and have giving us a look into your work. I will share my screen again. Boop. And the next presentation is with Meta Hotea, Martin Delbecke and Benoit Segan on Project Graph, text reuse in rare books. Meta Hotea, after studying history and receiving a PhD in Romania, uh, has been since 2009 the head of Department of Rare Books and Maps at the ETH Library. Furthermore, she coordinates the portal erara.ch, the platform for digitalized rare books and maps from Swiss libraries. Martin Delbecke is professor in the history and 
theory of architecture at the ETH and focuses mainly on European architecture of the period 1450 to 1850. He became interested in digital architectural history as the founding editor in chief of the first native digital journal in architectural history. Um, you can find the link here on the slide, journal.eahn.org. And Benoit Segat studied computer science at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Uh, after completing his PhD at the EPFL in 2018, he's been working where he worked to applied where he applied machine learning to track visual transmission in large iconographical collection. He's been lecturing at ETH Zurich and works as an independent expert on applying AI in, to cultural heritage data. The stage is yours. Let me unshare. Welcome, Meda, Martin, and Benoit. Yeah. So Meda, I'll let you start. Are you muted, Meda? Meda, Meda is muted. muted. She needs to unmute herself. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I will try again. First of all, thank you for your kind introduction. First of all, I will talk about the platform Erara and about the connection between Erara and the platform craft text reuse in Rarebox. The cooperative platform Erara not only present an easy access to numerous digitized documents, more than 84,000 84, titles, but also give us the possibility to work with the digital content in a digital way. The existing interfaces allow us an uncomplicated access to metadata and pictures. Beyond that, 20,000 titles are provided with OCR. This text can be directly downloaded via the website. This means that for the development of further new projects in the field of digital scholarship, the necessary basics are already existing. Can I please the next slide? The project graph text reuse in rare books is a collaboration between the ETH library and the chair of the history and theory of architecture. It was set up as an experiment exploring the possibilities of viewing text reuses as a graph of knowledge correlations, seeing them in context and navigate between both views. Right now, the graphs text corpus is based on text, more than 1,000 titles, from the rare books collection of the ETH li library with a focus on architecture. But I think Martin can tell us more about. Please, Martin. Thank you, Mira. Um, so over the last few years, Egaega has developed as a key resource for our teaching and research in architectural history here. Uh, at the chair and in the Department uh, of Architecture. So we've <clears throat> really become familiar uh, with the collection. And as such, uh, it, uh, seems, it seemed an ideal partner to scale up an experiment that uh, Benoit Seguin and I had uh, been developing at the chair, which was uh, to trace text reuse, so the reuse of similar texts or identical texts between different architectural uh, treatises and to do so with uh, computational uh, methods. Can I have the next slide? Uh, no? So uh, why is tracing reuse relevant for architectural history? So why would I as an architectural historian be interested in uh, scanning or, or uh, exploring texts for the reuse of particular uh, passages? This has to do partly with uh, you could say pre-1850 pre writing and publishing practices. Authors, you could say pre-19th century authors, rooted their uh, texts in imitation of or on comments and authorities. So 
writing itself was basically a practice that used and reused texts of previous authorities in order uh, to expand on them, to change them, to transform them, and to develop them. And this is specifically the case in architecture. Uh, architectural theory, which developed, you could say, as a discipline from the late 15th century uh, or the mid 15th century onwards, is very much rooted in comments on and editions of a single foundational text, the Ten Books of Architecture by Vitruvius, originally written around uh, uh, 30 BCE, and which was then uh, 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 it's sometimes called rediscovered in the early 15th century and then printed, edited, translated from 1486 onwards. There are a lot of traces uh, of Vitruvius' texts in books on architecture from that period uh, onwards. And as such, because of the importance of this foundational text, uh, uh, Benoit, I'm still uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, at no, no worries. Uh, uh, we also see that in books on architecture, actually very, various themes reoccur almost constantly. Uh, the question of the, the five orders, questions of proportions, building types, and so on. So we can hypothesize that there is actually quite a lot of text reuse between architectural uh, books of the period from uh, the late 15th century until the mid 19th century, which allows us to trace uh, the circulation and transform transformation of ideas, communities of knowledge and crossovers between these books. Benoit, now you can go. <laughs> so uh, the idea to use computational methods for uh, tracing text reuse, because in a way, tracing text reuse is also a very traditional scholarly method that was developed with the emergence of architectural history as a discipline from the 19th century onwards. So the idea to use computational methods was obviously rooted in, you could say, negative and positive arguments. Uh, uh, manual exploration of large bodies of text is obviously limited uh, uh, due to the uh, limited capacity of the human brain because it is time consuming but also because in a way, uh, exploration of uh, text is, the exploration of text is always guided by uh, hypotheses, by predefined corpora, you know, which have limits, uh, limits and biases that are basically built into themselves. It is also open-ended uh, precisely because of these limits. And you can, uh, it can take an enormous, uh, uh, a lot of time before you can actually validate a, a, a hypothesis and before you are sure that you've seen enough texts to uh, make an argument solid. At the same time, you know, as uh, uh, as the example of Igaga demonstrates, uh, we have an increasing availability of digitized uh, resources, and this, combined with the development of computational methods, uh, basically gave the impetus to uh, develop a graph and a, a, a computational approach to text streams. And how this is done is going to be uh, explained by Benoit. So I hand over to him. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, <clears throat> so to look a bit more precisely, so when we when you talk about text reuse, it's a um, special case of connection between text. So here's an example of if you look between the left and the right, it's almost the <laughs> same paragraph between uh, these two books. Um, on the, on the right, you have a, an excerpt from uh, the, the very important architectural treaty of uh, André Philippien, published in 1676. Uh, and a, if you look, obviously, it's basically extremely similar to something on Knox Missing that was published 50 years earlier. And um, as Martin was saying, this showed like a, some form of connection between, between them. Uh, but what we're looking for is just textual correlation, it's just the fact that the same words appear. We are not taking any stance computationally on, on the fact that one copied another, or if both are quoting a, a, a third book, which will be the primary source and so on and so forth. So we are just finding for correlation of words in a large uh, corpus of text. So the pipeline that we have to go through is relatively standard for a data science or data analysis uh, proce uh, process project. So, uh, which is first gathering the data. And here we rely a lot on IIIF that will be explained uh, 
much better later in the in the later presentation and doing the OCR of all this material, um, analyzing all this data uh, in a large process in order to find these text reuse connections between these books and these text passages, and then find a way to present the complexity uh, of this data with an explorable uh, web interface. So I will quickly go over uh, these three uh, these three steps before showing the, the the interface. So just in order to gather the data, we're in close relationship with the Ehara team, and we are especially Meda to say we are focusing on architecture history. What do you have related to architecture history in your digital? holdings uh, and uh, they gave us basically a list of a thousand triple f manifests and that was enough for us to work basically just with uh, just with all these manifests we could harvest the metadata and the corresponding 500,000 pages by harvesting them uh, in all cases the triple f metadata was enough but we even had access to the OEA uh, uh, like the open archive initiative uh, version which is a much more standardized and linked open data ready version of the metadata if we needed to. And then on top of that, on top of all these digitized uh, images, we perform a state of the art OCR based on Google OCR uh, in order to have uh, consistent performance of uh, all our data and because some material was not uh, authorized in the era holdings. Uh, so now we have these 500,000 pages of authorized text, uh, and we need to find textual correlation between all of them. So text reuse is a computationally ex uh, expensive task, computationally, um, because technically you need to compare everything to everything, like given any sentence, like does it appear somewhere else? Uh, you need to be able to handle some form of paraphrasing because it's not always direct quotation. There's kind of the same saying, the same sentence, which is sort of phrased the same way, which shows an influence, but it's not words to words the same thing. Uh, there are OCR errors, of course, because of the way the, the, the way we process the data, there are typographical changes and so on and so forth. But at the same time, uh, computer scientists and especially digital humanists have been working on this, on this problem for quite a few years and know there are major frameworks just like the the passim tool developed by david smith who, who is a former colleague of mine and it's very nice um, on related note and the nice thing about the passim tool is that it scales well to relatively large corpus uh, even if 500,000 pages is not extremely large it's still a decent size that you need to be careful about how to do things in order for your computation to actually finish the result of that showed us that out of all our books, 40% uh, of the books were at, at, at least one connection with another book, corresponding to 655 pairs of connected books, which is significant. And that comes from how consistent or something of books were, because of how really all, all they were all related to architecture history. I'm not going over the details of how you do this because of course it's not just you take the data you put it in and you get the results uh, you have to you have to um, to do a lot of small things properly uh, but this is out of the scope of this presentation um, then the way we presented the data we wanted to be able to show the global structure of how the books spread with each other in the form of global viewings what we sometimes people will call distant reading unfold of sort. And on the other hand, we wanted for the user to be able to go to the actual passages, to the actual um, like characters, words, like how these documents match. What does it mean for a connection to be there? Uh, can, I, can I look as closely as possible at what there is in this data and being able to go back and forth between the two representations? And from a technical point of view, uh, that made uh, actually a re relatively light deployment because it's a read-only application. Uh, it's only a way to display all the things which are pre-computed before. So from a deployment point of view for the library, it's relatively simple. And all the image delivery uh, of the digitized pages is done by the Errara AAAF servers already. So that's where the Errara infrastructure allow us to build this kind of application on top of it without having to manage the heavy stuff, basically, which is uh, image handling. So I'll just show quickly what it looks like. Uh, so if you, if you were to go on the, uh, on the graph uh, rarebooks.eth.th, uh, there's more introduction. And then if you go on the graph view, there uh, you will get the uh, network, right? There you go. Uh, there you get the global view 
of how all these books relate with each other. So on this representation, each node is a book and each uh, edge between two nodes, between two dots, is the fact that there was some detected connections, some detected text reuse between these two books. Um, Martin, do you want to say a word on this? Yes. So uh, you could say on a very first level, on a, on a very global level, uh, uh, the, uh, the graph allows you to see points of density uh, uh, and uh, also the fact that you basically have a galaxy again with the center and then various forms of smaller and bigger outliers. So for instance, if you type in uh, Vitruve, uh, uh, if you filter by uh, Vitruve, you see that, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this treatise of Vitruvius is literally at the center uh, of a lot of texts and that there are <clears throat> a whole range of connections uh, and of connected books that uh, uh, are connected to each other uh, uh, starting from that center. If, for instance, we uh, type in Blondel, uh, Blondel who is, uh, and there are several Blondels who are important uh, authors in architectural theory uh, in France, uh, you basically see uh, that there's a that there are a couple of connections uh, with the Vitruvian node of the galaxy, uh, but at the same time that there's a kind of sub galaxy uh, that exists uh, of probably French treatises uh, 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 at a certain distance. And then if we type in fort to look for books uh, on fortifications, then I think it becomes interesting because there you see that there are several uh, separate uh, uh, connecting uh, nodes. So on the far left, for instance, uh, uh, you have a, a rather large uh, constellation uh, of uh, uh, mainly French books on, on military architecture. If you then go to the extreme uh, right, uh, you have, uh, uh, for instance, the, the kind of isolated a connection, yeah, that one uh, of uh, uh, basically three Italian books on the same topic, but which uh, are situated at opposing ends uh, of uh, the galaxy. So already in, in this very global view, you can you can start uh, looking around uh, to see, uh, uh, to look for potentially interesting nodes within the galaxy. Obviously, and uh, Benoit already mentioned this, the fact that there is uh, <laughs> A connection that there is text reuse uh, between the two books in, uh, indicated in this graph doesn't tell you anything about the, the percentage of overlap uh, between the two books, uh, nor uh, between uh, uh, nor about the meaning uh, of this uh, overlap. Huh? So in a way, this is <clears throat> a kind of first step to start exploring possible connections and then obviously uh, start asking questions what these various connections could be about and what they could mean. I think uh, Benoit is going to dive a little bit deeper into uh, some specific uh, uh, connections just to show the different kinds of uh, questions and results uh, that emerge from the graph. Um, yeah, so for instance, during a workshop we were doing, someone was asking, uh, it was interested in garden making and gardening. And so we looked at um, uh, Jardin in French, and there was only one book that was coming up, uh, which is here. And this one is a Traité de la Composition et l'Ornement du Jardin. So it's about garden making and garden uh, composing. Uh, and it has uh, connection, so everything is interactable. You can zoom, but you can also click on node and edge. And if you click on the edge, it says, oh, it has like a few pages in common with the treaty about mechanics applied to the arts. And it was not obvious, you know, why is gardening linked with mechanics? So then you can go to the close reading view by clicking on compare here. And then uh, if you do that, you get a, you, you, you get, um, a side by side view of the two books uh, with people familiar with Super Life will recognize how does that look like. Uh, and you can only show the pages which actually have matches with the other book. Uh, so you say, okay, 110, there are matches here. And if I click on that, that thing, it will align directly where on the other book at which page this passage is found, if it was, if it was found. Uh, and we see basically that this is uh, all the matching part are about uh, pumps in order uh, to make fountains in gardens, which then makes sense that uh, for people focus on how to make garden once one part is 
how do you how do you handle water how do you make pumps and then they kind of were inspired by that book that was published uh, six years later in, in how to describe this. So what was interesting as well is that if you take, uh, if you go on page 113, you have certain part here that comes from page 39 on the other book, but just next to it, there is some other element that comes from page 28. So then you get this very granular understanding of how these specific passages are sometimes reorganized. It's not just one paragraph taken. It's how you take like a two sentence here and two sentence there. So you get very, you, we can get very granular in how we, how we. Um, and the last thing maybe to show is that some failure cases, because we are also engineers, so we need to show where it doesn't work. Um, so if you were to look for the English term for, uh, for gardening, um, you might find this connection here between an encyclopedia no it's the other one maybe yeah between the landscape uh, gardening architecture and a book on suspension bridges and there's like well that's interesting why you would get that um, and if you look on the detail of what the text reuse were found between these two books um, then uh, you will get once once I get them uh, triple I do not fail me now uh, then you will see that the text reviews you find are actually advertisements by the printer and by the publisher at the end of the book of all the books they were making. So of course, you find the same sentence, which computationally speaking, it's true. There are the same words appearing in the same order, and there is some some textual correlation, but it's not a useful one. So we all we also get. What we call some false positive that then sometimes when you look at it, say, oh, this is actually uninteresting. But computationally, it makes sense that we find that. So I would try to wrap up things extremely quickly. So I won't talk about the next improvements and what we want to uh, to do next. But if people want to ask about it, they can. Um, I might just want to say the fact that this project was working well, I think in my opinion was uh, because of a couple of points. First, because of how the data was available and interoperable through the ERARA platform and how we could leverage that to make the application quickly and well. Uh, how the goal and the task that we were giving for ourselves was well-defined uh, from an operationalizable point of view. It's we're trying to find textual correlation. We're not trying to find things that have to mean something. We just try to find textual correlation, and that's much more well defined from a computational point of view. And finally, the fact that the process, the analysis, and the interface are tightly coupled together. And I think it was very important uh, in the way we make a final product that the result of the process is directly linked to how we make the interface and in and, and back and forth way. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Meda, Martin, and Benoit, for your lovely presentation and in-depth explanation of your project. Again, we have a couple of minutes to take questions from the floor. Uh, if you have it, oh, I see a hand, but I don't know from who. Nicole. <laughs> no hand. <laughs> it was a test. <laughs> I see another hand. Wait, where do I see it? It is Garusha. Do you want to unmute yourself to ask your question? Yeah, sure. So for how long did you work on this project? Benoit. Uh, so the, um, the initial exploration started with Martin, what, early 2019, uh, early 2020? Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> But uh, but at the at, at the beginning it was exploring how to connect books in general general sense. So there was there were also experiment with connecting images as well uh, with uh, visual similarity. So there are, so there are different aspects. But we found out the most valid uh, experiment to scale up was a text reuse one. Uh, and then the development with the ETH was quite short. I think it was just two months, something like that. July till uh, November. Sorry, Meda. July, July November. till November. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just two months and a half uh, for oh. the scaling at the ETH collection here. Yeah. 
Interesting. And um, so I just saw like French and English texts. Do you just work with French and English, English texts or as well with other texts or languages? Uh, no, the, like, uh, there are a lot of German text, of course. Uh, it comes from the Herrera holdings. So the, alg the algorithm is language agnostic, uh, but it will not, it, it's really working on word correlation and textual correlation, like character correlation. So it, I try to make experiments at trying to find like cross language matches, uh, which I thought maybe was one of the questions in the chat. Uh, and I was a bit disappointed by the results. It's extremely hard. Uh, I mean, the big AI company will tell you that all this problem of translation is solved. Uh, but when you work with all text, with OCR errors, uh, and where, where we don't have a lot of training data coming from the web on it, I was a bit disappointed by what I could get with, uh, with cross uh, cross language like translation uh, translation matches. So right now it's it really find matches across a single language. That kind of why we also have clusters across languages in the in the in the results. So excuse me, um, I didn't understand it really well. So it works now across languages, like French, English, also like an English book and a French book. So uh, if there if there's a paragraph like in French and English, and it's it if it means the same, then it detects that. Yeah, no, yeah. No. Oh, okay. I, I tried to make an experiment on it, and uh, it was really not working well enough to be integrated in, oh, no. in the other. But uh -huh. the thing is, if the book is in French and has a citation in English, then it will find it. Okay. So, so but this is the way you want to explore it further in the future. So you want to work on that, or you think like doesn't really matter. I think the technology is not ready yet uh, to be easily doable. I think if you were Google and wanted to do it, sure they could do it. Like it's, it will be possible with enough investment, basically, but uh, not for the kind of project we're doing. Okay, thank you very much, Benoit. We also have a question in the chat from Jelke Josen. Uh, he asked, "Were all of the scanned books in a good state?" Um, he says he can he can imagine. I <laughs> don't understand. Somebody eliminate Glad Banosovic. Um. Maybe. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It was funny. Um, so he says he can imagine that they, someone needs to unmute them and needs to mute themselves. Uh, Right. Uh, he can imagine that it can be interesting to annotate and analyze any handwritten notes that were added to these pub publications, depending on the ownership. The text reuse element reminds him of the Beckett Digital Library within the Beckett Digital Manuscript Project. Does it? Yes, Carl. Gabriela, can you please eliminate I Glad? I you. have. Uh, I've tried. Oh. I'm going to try again. But I've okay. eliminated him now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Our first troll. Yeah. <laughs> From Russia. Uh, Meta, do you want to do you want to answer about the the scanning, like the state of the scanning? I don't understand really the question. I'm so sorry. I was disturbed a little bit from <laughs> Yeah, sorry. The question was whether there were any like handwritten annotations in the books, or whether we just used yes, like. Yes, there are. There are um, some of them, um, but this is not really. Um, we don't. We don't. We don't want to to work in this case with the annotation. We were focused uh, only at the, on the text, and for annotation, we have another project. Provenance databases, and there they are the, they are the um, annotation from these books. I think um, it's another thema. It's another it's another thema. It's 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 not possible in this case to work in in also with the annotation. Perhaps Benoit, you have another idea. Um, well, for the 
uh, handwritten annotation, it would be yes. possible to automatically detect them uh, computationally because they are visually salient thing. For in order to transcribe them, uh, 100 transcription has made a lot of progresses over the last few years, but depending on the situation, uh, it's usable or not, or it needs like, it needs a lot of additional training. So it's still, there is not a cookie cut answer for 100 and transcription. Even if no, in most situations, there is something you can do about it. If you're, if you're, really motivated then now it's doable basically um and uh yeah that that could be something interesting that's not the direction we're we're aiming uh, at the moment or a lot of other things uh we want to improve on but that's an interesting idea yalko says thank you as well <laughs> um i feel like we're running out of time uh how and i think also martin has to go because he's got a lecture now so i want to thank so much meta martin and benoit for the presentation if anyone has more questions uh obviously you can ask them in the chat again we will send them forward to the presenters or maybe um yeah i think that's the best solution right now the next present oh i'm gonna share my screen again the next presentation is by Yannick Borkata on object recognition entity extraction on Wikimedia Commons. And Yannick, who comes originally from Tune, is studying a bachelor's degree in business information systems. Before his studies, he also did an apprenticeship uh, in electronics as an electronics technician. And during his presentation is basically his bachelor thesis, but the project itself would outlive his bachelor. Yannick, the floor is yours. I'm gonna stop my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to share my screen now. Um, are, you are you able to see my presentation? Yes. yes. Thank you very much for the feedback. Um, then first of all, um, hello everyone. I would like to welcome you all to my presentation today on the current state of my bachelor thesis and therefore on entity extraction from images on Wikimedia Commons. Um, in my presentation, I would like to briefly discuss Wikimedia Commons because I don't know who knows uh, what Wikimedia Commons is, what it's used for and then the idea and the goals of our project as well as work that has already been completed. Um, to give you a better understanding then of the project I'm doing right now, I will then talk about two tools that, are, uh, that have to be combined in my bachelor thesis. Um, finally, I will go into some of the problems that have arisen in the work and the further procedure in my work. And finally, then you are very welcome to ask any questions and to discuss the topic with me. So let's start with a quick introduction to Wikimedia Commons. And um, I think most of, all, of you probably know Wikimedia Commons. Um, on Wikimedia Commons, um, GLAM institutions, as well as private individuals and companies can upload images and other files. The uploaders and community members can then add metadata to those images. And this can take the form of titles, descriptions, geolocation, or tags, which are also called the PIX statements. The tags are here to identify objects that are present on the individual images and to add them as, in, as metadata to the pictures. However, this manual addition of metadata, metadata requires a lot of time and effort, especially when large collections of images are uploaded on Wikimedia Commons, which is usually the case for GLAM institutions. Um, the idea of the Bern University of Applied Sciences is now to provide the GLAM institutions with a service that makes it easier to add this metadata. This is to be done above all with regard to the meta that, metadata that is exclusively available on the images. For this reason, the use of various already existing, existing visual recognition services for tag generation was investigated in an in initial thesis. 
It turned out that the combination of different services delivers already very good results. The biggest problem, however, um, that arose in this project was the matching of the generated tags with the corresponding Wikidata items. In some cases, items with the same name but very different meanings were linked. In a subsequent casework, uh, an attempt was made to eliminate some of those problems from the first project. In this work, um, I trained an own visual recognition service with IBM Watson. Uh, by training the service itself and to correct the Wikidata items could all already be used directly, which eliminates the matching process and therefore simplifies the whole process. And it also saves a lot of time. However, there were still certain problems with this service, which will now be addressed uh, in this Padlet thesis. Um, the, the biggest problem that, uh, that we saw was that there's already such a, uh, a visual recognition service avail available on Wikimedia Commons, which already provides a lot of data, uh, better data, better tags, and depict statements. However, also this tool has some problems. One problem is with the CAT tool that I mentioned now um, is that there are, there's only the possibility to tag individual images. So there is a, no function that allows, as, as an example, climb institutions to provide all their pictures to the whole community at once. This makes it, um, this is where the second tool comes in, um, which is a, a tool for crowdsourcing. Um, so let's talk about the goal of my work before I introduce you to the different tools. In my work, I will try to combine the computer-aided tagging tool with the crowdsourcing tool IS, ISA. The combination of the tools should make it possible to make entire image collections available to the community and thus use the crowdsourcing approach to reduce the effort for GLAM institutions. GLAM institutions should also be involved in development in order to offer them the best possible added value. If there are any opportunities for further improvement of the service, this should also be considered in my work. This could be in the form of uh, additional information like geolocation, um, a natural language processing algorithm, or also bounding boxes that mark the exact location of the objects found. Furthermore, the possibility of using this service for images outside of the Wikimedia Commons platform should also be investigated. So now let's move on to the first tool I used in my work. The computer aided tagging tool I mentioned earlier was introduced as a Wikimedia extension in November 2019. The idea was to simplify adding the pics for images or the pic statements. Google Vision is therefore used in the background to generate those tags. Only the images and no additional information is submitted to the Google service, which is a really important information since this uh, was rejected um, by the Wikimedia community. Also, no nobody wanted that more information than the pictures was provided to the Google service. Those tags um, which come from this Google service are automatically generated for each newly uploaded image and must be verified by Wikimedia Commons users in order to be added as metadata. This is also very important because an automatic addition of the tags was refused by the community as well. So let's have a look at this tool. And the tool looks something like this, uh, where you have a big picture in the middle and then below, uh, the image you have different depict suggestions from the tool uh, which are 
generated automatically for each picture. The user is now able to add those statements very easy by just clicking on them and saving them. The second tool used in this work is the so-called ISA tool. The ISA tool was originally intended to improve the multilingual and structured descriptions for all Wikilovs images. However, this tool can also be used for any image collection on Wikimedia Commons. This tool makes it possible to use crowdsourcing to add metadata to images in a specific Wikimedia Commons category. With this tool, Commons users can add the pics or captions as metadata to images. As you can see, uh, this tool is uh, built up very similar to the computer-aided tagging tool. Um, the image is also displayed in the center, but there are also some additional uh, there's also additional information shown to the user for each picture, such as the file name, uh, the, the description, and so on. Below this, there is a box for the depict statements. Um, the user can search for Wikidata items using the search function and then add them as a depict statement. There's also the possibility to declare an item as prominent and therefore as an important object in an image. In my work, uh, these two tools are to be combined in order to use the computer-aided tagging tool for larger image collections. Uh, in order to re realize this, I work together with the developers of the ISA tool. The suggestions generated by the CAT tool were integrated into the ISA tool and are presented to the users as well. This feature can easily be activated um, for each ISA campaign if the user adds the term um, question mark MV equals true to the URL. URL. After the successful combination, uh, the first feedback could already be obtained. On the one hand, Feedback, uh, the feedback received um, re regarding the design and functionality of the prototype, as well as critical feedback from the community. And the, the feedback from the community was rather critical as it was feared that the new tool would encourage new users to add inaccurate depicts to the images instead of the most accurate ones. This is also due to the fact uh, that some community members are only partially satisfied with the tags generate, generated by the ISA users. Now, as you can see on screen, um, the ISA tool has been extended with the suggestions of the computer-aided tagging tool. Uh, the individual tags can now also be added by clicking and also be declared as prominent. In addition, there is also the possibility uh, to hover over a tag to get more detailed description if a certain term is, uh, as an example, not known or unclear. Um, so let's move on to the current problems in my project. Uh, the original plan was to involve external partners, um, in my case, LAM institutions, in the first tests to see if there is any added value for them. Uh, and what they need from the tool uh, to be useful. However, most of the images that were to be used have not been processed by the computer-aided tagging tool um, and therefore have no tags. And this is due to the fact that only newly uploaded files um, will get the tags from the CAT tool. For this reason, the Wikimedia Commons team uh, that developed the computer-aided tagging tool was asked if there was a way to tag those images afterwards. However, this is not possible at the moment. Our initiative has nevertheless triggered the development of a script that should make this possible. However, this will take longer than my bachelor's thesis. Also, an, alter an alternative image collection could not be found easily. For this reason, the tests with external parties will only be carried out after my thesis has been completed. 
As a result, my bachelor thesis will now also have to be steered in a, in a bit of a different direction. Um, in order to be able to continue with my work, um, other approaches should be pursued. On the one hand, I still want to collect feedback on the design and usability in order to improve the tool. Furthermore, I want to analyze how good the tags generated by the ISA tool users are. The aim is to check whether the tags comply with the Wikimedia Commons guidelines and whether the tags are useful. This is to possibly strengthen uh, the trust of the community in this tool. The third approach is to find out how relevant people such as collisions and so on can be tagged in portraits. Currently, the computer-aided tagging tool is not very good at this. So we need uh, um, to find out how this could be done successfully. Um, this already brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, but before I now open the Q&A session and an open discussion where you are very welcome to ask anything, um, I would like to briefly point out that I am also currently conducting tests with the presented ISA tool um, in order to improve it and to see whether the concerns from the community are actually justified. Um, for this reason, I would like to invite you all uh, to register as a tester and support me there. Um, I will also post um, a link to a landing page for the tests uh, in the chat, and then you can uh, register as a test user if you would like to do so. Um, then I would like to say uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention. And uh, yes, you are free to ask any questions that, arisen, that have arisen through my presentation. Thank you so much, Yannick, for your presentation. And just as a heads up, we can also share the link in the hack chat of the hackathon. So if, when you're sharing the link, we can also post it in the Slack. This would be amazing. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Um, and you all know the drill. If you have any question, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself once we've said your name. I saw... Gerusha, did you raise your hand or was it a mistake? It was, okay, <laughs> all good. So any questions for Yannick, please go ahead and ask them away. Don't be shy. <laughs> I have a question maybe. Um, yes. I think there's a lot of talk about um, like bias in automatic image tagging. Um, have you come across this problem or how do you, how do you address it? Um, I have seen um, already some discussions uh, regarding this. Um, however, the Wikimedia Commons um, developers which uh, developed this tool um, uh, just disabled all the tags that are currently produced with this cert with a certain bias as, as, as an example. Uh, some community members uh, think that this cat tool is sexist uh, or uh, racist and stuff like that and the developers are already working on that. Um, but most important it is also um, I have to mention that all the tags are not automatically um, added to this uh, to the images so that they can be controlled by by a human and verified before they are added um, so that there is probably less risk regarding that thank you uh, if i may ask um, what is the proportion on wikimedia commons of material which are uh, uh, historic images manuscripts or like what uh, what would be more glam materials and which are not born digital photograph because coming from the computer vision side we know that usually like quite a significant gap in performance when you bring this automatic tagging system on historical images like even if it's black and white images i'm not even talking about engraving or paintings um yes uh, thank you also for this question um, I also noticed um, that there are 
always um, a big proportion from the climate institutions are also scanned texts or pictures of a picture um, because they can't be scanned and there the um, the CAT tool doesn't provide uh, such good results uh, because as, as an example, then it just recognizes that it's a photograph, but it doesn't recognize the things in the photograph. And that is, that is, that is also a problem that has to be addressed in the future uh, when it comes to the CAT tool, I think. Because if I if I may comment on that, uh, I've worked quite a bit with uh, for art history institution for automatic tagging uh, related to paintings, drawing, and this kind of thing. And generally, they try to use this automatic tagging system. And for this kind of material, it just doesn't perform as well, and they have to train their their own model for the for their own specific categories. Uh, if you're interested, you can look at the. The Faros Research Group, uh, which is a consortium of international photo archives, and I don't know if they've published anything, but they are very interested in in this kind of automatic tagging for their photo collections. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much. I, I will also have a look at that. Um, yes, uh, as as you already mentioned, uh, I also think that the results when it comes to drawn pictures uh, or drawings as a general are, are less less good than if it's a, a digital image. So there would maybe also be a, a specific um, computer vision or computer, computer aided tagging tool which um, focuses on those things that would have to be developed, which is not the case at the moment. Thank you for your answer, Yannick. Um, and for your questions, Benoit, of course. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Mm. So Yannick has just uh, shared the link to the website for the test users. So if you want to have a look, uh, just have a look at the link in the chat. I will also share the link in the, in the you're in, are you in the Slack chat, Yannick? Um, I think I'm not yet in the Slack chat. I, I will have to search for the link. <laughs> We can share the link here. I'm going to share it right now. OK, thank you very much. So for everyone who hasn't signed up yet for the Slack, I warmly encourage you to do that um, because you actually need it in order to be productive and efficient during the hackathon tomorrow. And I will also, so, and you can share. Actually, there is a there is a channel called Hack Chat, and you you're very free to share your link there, Yannick. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, of course. And Elias asks Benoit if he can also post a link to the Faros group around historical photographs again these are things you can you're very very well encouraged oh but if you have links that might be interesting for the audience for the hackers for the people participating during the glam hack please feel free to share them uh, in the slack and if we have a lot of interesting links uh, we might make a collection of them in the aftermath with a thank you note at the end so if you have interesting platforms or websites and so on, you're very, very welcome to share them. And the best thing is to share them in the Slack 
if you have links that you want more people to see because uh, they will be definitely safe there and Zoom links or Zoom chats do not tend to be uh, archived over time. So in the name of archiving and memorizing everything, let's do it on Slack. And if there is no any more questions, I would like to ask if our next presenters, speakers are already prepared or in the room. Elias, are you ready? Yes, we are. Okay. You are? <laughs> Wonderful. So then I'm gonna, well, thank you again so much, Yannick, for your presentation and good luck with your bachelor thesis. Thank you very much. And the next presentation, I'm going to share my screen again, is getting started with triple IF. Did I say it right, Elias? Yes. <laughs> uh, with Annabelle Vigard, Elias Crayon-Bull, and Nobutake Kamiya. Uh, Annabelle has started working in libraries 10 years ago and acquired a Bachelor of Science in Information Science from the Fachhochschule Graubünden. Uh, in the last few years, her interests and activities gradually, gradually shifted from classical librarian tasks to working with library-related data. In January this year, so very, very recently, she started working as a software developer in the newly created ZB Lab, the lab of the Zentralbibliothek Zürich. And in her free time, she enjoys making and learning music production with Linux and open source software. And I think what's also interesting, she's worked in an origami factory in Japan for a month. Uh, Elias Krembühl is a data librarian. He is very passionate about making data available in better ways for researchers and the creative community as well. Cultural heritage infrastructures used to be quite monolithic. I, I need to kind of make a quick note here because all the presenters sent me their biographies with really big words and I had to practice them beforehand uh, to be quite monolithic. This is why Elias thinks triple IF has a huge potential to leverage usage of digitized objects in so many ways. Collections can be easily curated across collections, but the triple IF API can be used in various machine learning scenarios as well. When he's not making data, he's off the screen skiing and motorcycling. And Nobutake is a librarian as, at the University of Zurich in the Institute of Asian and Oriental Studies. And he's interested in the digital skills that enable us to collaborate with each other and to be creative. And in his free time, he's a drummer. Annabelle, Elias, and Nobutake, I'm gonna unshare my screen and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having us. So I'm um, very happy to present because um, we thought, um, IIIF is quite well known now in the library community, but since uh, we are here also together with uh, programmers and people from the creative industries, uh, we thought it might be cool to give uh, some quick introduction how to get started with IIIF as a programmer. So our main um, focus is now how to uh, do things um, in a hackathon using IIIF resources and tools from the open source IIIF community. So um, I will show some preliminaries and talk, uh, give a quick overview about IIIF. And Annabelle is uh, showing how to install um, the quite well-known Mirador viewer and simple annotation server. And Nobutake is uh, showing the walk you through the installation of Trip Life curation, curation Viewer or Curation Platform, actually. And he gives also some hints how to work with Wikidata and Trip Life. So, as you see, we are actually combining the, all the previous talks, and that's quite fun. Um, I was not aware of this uh, beforehand. So, that's quite cool. So, on the next slide, um, what is actually Trip Life? It really allows you to access images, uh, and actually not only images, more and more also audiovisual content, uh, no matter where they are stored. And we have just seen this wonderful example in the graph of rare books. Um, and so materials can be accessed 
much more easily and reused in whether a personal way for like an individual researcher or uh, in uh, like computer to computer or machine to machine scenario. And uh, maybe Annabelle, you can just show um, what you would do um, when you grab a IIIF manifest from a platform. You see here on uh, eManuscript, uh, you see uh, the IIIF link is, is mentioned in the middle here under links. And actually you can just grab this and put it into a IIIF viewer. Sometimes you just copy it or you, you, so this is really like magic. An entire book can be presented um, in, in a totally different place, agnostic from the original source. And the unit or the like the, the coin or the exchange format is this um, little JSON file uh, called manifest. So this is just as a quick introduction. I think many of you know this already. And um, Annabelle, could you give me the other slide of, thank you very much. So IIIF consists of a series of, um, uh, I like to have the post-its again, sorry, um, a series of APIs uh, and most prominently the image API and a presentation API. Uh, that's also key because um, images come not only by themselves, but they are surrounded by metadata, which is very important, and also the structural information. That means maybe like uh, um, chapters, or even if you have a um, Hebrew manuscript, for instance, uh, you look it from the right to the left side, all this information is included in, in this presentation IP API, which the manifest is a part of. And so since this is a standard, uh, standardized way, um, a lot of open source tools are now available and that makes it for you programmers very easy to adopt IIIF and to go on and do really fancy stuff with the available tools, but also with the available content. And by now, IIIF was coming up like uh, 2014. I'm not quite sure about this, but it, it was around then. Uh, and right now already 1 billion images are available in IIIF. So this is quite the potential. And on the next slide, I'm, I'm gonna show you a little bit some data sources. Of course, Irara, we have seen already in manuscript as well. Ecodices in e newspapers archives also has uh, implemented IIIF, but also big portals like Europeana or the Smithsonian collection and beautiful collections um, uh, accessible via IIIF. A very nice uh, platform is actually Biblissima, which I just noticed I have forgotten to mention. I'm going to add the link uh, later on uh, where you can browse through multiple collections of various um, cultural heritage institutions uh, from Europe and abroad. So um, what we've done here, we're not gonna show you um, PowerPoint or whatever slides presentation, but this is this Google doc we prepared for you. So you can look up things uh, right here. And uh, so all the links you can click on, if you're looking for image collections, please go ahead, use this. And um, sometimes it's not obvious uh, that platforms do use IIIF, so they, they're not um, prominently exposing the IIIF manifests. But there is a simple tool actually uh, facilitating this. Um, this is called Detective. And this is, thank you very much, that's great. So this is a browser plugin for Chrome and you can install it and it will detect immediately if there is um, a manifest or even an image API mentioned on the page you are looking at. So this is very helpful 
for collecting uh, images and you can also create um, IIIF collections. You can put them into a basket and then copy the IIIF collection. So you can do uh, your own collection and uh, go to a different tool and go on. So I think this is it already for my part. Um, and Annabelle is now going to show you the uh, how to install um, Mirador Viewer. So, Annabelle, I'm going to mute myself and hand it over okay. to you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, actually, I'm not going to show the installation, but I have put for you uh, an installation instructions for the tools I'm going to demo in our Google Doc. I also mentioned a couple of installation problems I ran into, so you don't run into them again. I'm just going to show you a quick demo of the Mirador <coughs> viewer with an annotation plugin installed. So a way to make annotation to uh, image material. So this is Mirador 3, the newest version of this IIIF viewer. And um, I have loaded a um, an image resource of a 13th century manuscript, and I have these allegorical um, figures in the upper left corner, and I want to annotate them. So I can just click on this plus icon and select an area in the image. I'm going to select this figure here, and I'm going to say that it is a representation of wickedness. And then I have this other figure and I'm gonna select this. And this is a representation of the sense of touch. So now I can see my annotations here on the left and when I hover over them, I see the corresponding area in the image. So as I said, um, the installation of the Mirador viewer, which runs in your web browser, and the annotations plugin, uh, we have listed this here in the, in the Google Doc. And this is already very nice. Uh, the only problem is that my annotations are just stored in my browser cache. So um, other users cannot see them. And also if I delete my browser cache, then they're gone. And in order to um, store them permanently and um, be able to search them also, I need to install a annotation server. So there are a couple of open source tools out there. Um, and uh, I'm not familiar with all of them. I'm just going to um, show you the simple annotation server again we have put installation instructions in the Google Doc. So all of these tools, you should be able to get them up and running in a local installation within 15 minutes, if you don't run into problems. Um, so I'm going to refresh this page. So this is, um, I, I installed um, this simple annotation server locally. It includes uh, an instance of the Mirador viewer, but in version two, because version three is not yet compatible with the annotation server. So I'm going to add an image resource here. Sorry, I have to move something. And previously, I have uh, done some annotations already. So I have um, marked two instances of a hair ribbon in paint, painting. Um, now, if this was installed on a server, I could um, work collaboratively uh, with a team on these image resources. We could um, all make annotations and see the annotations of the other. And these annotations have now been stored on the server, but I cannot search them yet. There is a search tab and there is no search service yet registered. And in order to um, be able to search the annotations, I have to enhance the manifest, so the JSON file, which defines the image resource. I have to enhance it with a, a search service. And also, I did this already, 
Um, also, I need to link the, um, the annotation list, uh, which contains the annotations for my image. I, I need to link it in the image manifest. So I've done this already and saved the enhanced manifest locally on my computer. And I have um, installed a plugin for the Chrome browser, so the web server for Chrome. Uh, and now I'm just pretending this situation that it's somewhere on the server. And I load this in again. And here we go. And now I should see a search service here. And now if I look for my hair ribbon, then I can, now if I click on another image maybe, I can travel directly to the corresponding um, image areas. So this is what I wanted to show you. Um, now I'm gonna unshare my screen and give over to you, Nobu. Okay, thank you, Annabelle. And okay, I will share my screen now. So do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to in introduce you uh, software triple IF creation platform. And uh, this software is developed by uh, Center for Open Data in the Humanities. And this is a uh, Japanese um, institution. And uh, what you can um, is, maybe I can show you this link. Um, um, the Japanese researcher um, had uh, collected the uh, facial expressions with his softwares and annotated with uh, many tags. And And you can you can see the many facial collections from this um, created viewers and and after that you can um, yeah you can get uh, many um, images uh, for the facial collections and you can use it for um, for example um, AIs um, to create the Japanese um, facial images automatically and so on and. This software is open source and free, and you can um, also install it on your own server. Um, for example, I installed on my own servers, and you can maybe see my viewer, and I can get some images from hmm, the information source. I have to show you so this is a um uh so we have marked um images from japanese uh book and i can drag it on the viewer and i want to clop the image of the so we have marked from this book, this is uh, this is there, and I can crop it. And I have I want to keep it on my creation list, and and then if I want to get the another image from the another server. For example, there is a uh, this one. Um, maybe I want to take an image from Irara, and I can also take it in the same way. And And I can crop it in the same way um, and somehow so, and I put it on the list. And I can export it on my Firebase.
and you can see the curated view on the viewer something like that like that and um i can make a metadata for that Hmm. Image. And I cannot uh, label and uh, contents of the label. Um, somehow so. And update the creation. Oh. Okay, I don't know somehow it, well, it don't it doesn't work now, but you can you can use it normally. And this is a software, and um, I've written the uh, how how to install uh, this software with Docker, and I've documented the solutions because I have uh, some errors uh, at the installation, and but you can you can solve somehow <laughs> and in this this was a in uh, the software um survive creation platform and you can use uh, what well, you can use a demo of this software on this side if you want to try it out um i can share the link in the chat and that was it and what i want to show you is uh, the collaboration between wikidata and IIIF. and uh, first of all wikidata has a property for triple if manifest um under the p six uh, hundred hundred eight and you can put it up IIIF images and after that you can search the IIIF images um, through the Sparkle query from Wikidata. I think it's very useful and there are some projects um, for Wikidata. Um, they uh, reported to Jason Evans on the Twitter yesterday I think. Um, he and his team has um, tagged Images in uh, uh, IIIF images uh, and uh, and put it in the Wikidata uh, I think property 180 and they are now searchable uh, through the Sparkle query. I mm, I can. Yeah. And you can find it uh, through the uh, Sparkle query and some images from Wikidata. In this way, you can combine the Wikidata and Triple IF. And, and I think it's very exciting. So um, that's all from me. And maybe Elias, do you want to say something after that? Yes, yeah, so I just want to uh, mention that um, we, I was, I was, I forgot to mention actually Omeka. Uh, I think Omeka is quite well known in, in this community. So it's, uh, it's also possible to uh, import uh, IIIF by, into the Omeka um, content management system. But with the Omeka S, you have also the possibility to um, create your own IIIF server. And in the, at the end of the, um, here we can also, we added a, a tutorial that Nobu was presenting last year and you still can refer on his um, instructions. So if you're interested in Omeka and IIIF, you can look it up in the Google Doc here. But um, yes, I think it's it's a good uh, moment to open up for the discussions, since also um, the previous talks were 
very close to each other. And um, we have seen the, um, what Yannick did with uh, Wikicommons and now Nobu showed um, very similar um, project uh, with Wikidata. So I think it's, um, it's very interesting to open up a discussion now. Thank you so much, Nobutake, Elias, and Annabelle for your presentation. And I've pinned you, but I can also unpin you so that everyone can see everyone, I think. So questions from the floor. Uh, Meda, please unmute, you, unmute yourself. Nope, that was not a question. Okay. <laughs> Are you planning to work on a specific challenge over the weekend related to IIIF? Um, I, I don't know for the others, but me personally, actually not. It was just um, the topic came up as an idea because in the uh, Zurich Central Library uh, Data Lab, we started exploring the possibilities of IIIF and we felt like sharing what we discovered. But actually for the hackathon, I'm working on something completely different this time. Me either or not either. <laughs> and uh, Nobu uh, is also heading towards text. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, but I... I thought there is a kind of project for music, right? And uh, maybe there, but I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, can you see me? Anna yes. Keller, yes. <laughs> I actually didn't plan to, to talk about it anyway. So, um, right, so there is a project where we want to do some on air uh, uh, combined, possibly. Um, with creating audio files for digitized music scores, um, IIIF might be an option. So actually the task will be to create a workflow and IIIF might be a solution to that. So yeah, but we will, it is one, one alternative. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thank you. If there are any other triple IF ideas, just speak up. Uh, well, I, I want to mention I was very impressed by what uh, the Graph Rare Books uh, project did. And uh, it actually is really at the heart of like the ambition to, you know, to give access also in a machine readable uh, format. And I was very happy to, to, to hear what you said, Benoit, that it made your work really easy to, um, to delve into these uh, collections. And I also uh, was thinking about um, how we could still improve um, the instrument or platforms or, or also like for ERARA. And um, I think it would be very nice to have some filter functions, actually facets are already there, but we cannot access um, collections like only, um, let's say um, thematic collections or so. Mm -hmm. I think for research, it could be very uh, nice to have, um, to drill down like your search results and then have to, do, to generate uh, like a, a big manifest or a triple IF collection so you, to facilitate the access. So that's actually a question I would like to ask to Benoit. Uh, how did you um, put together your corpus? Uh, I think it was, um, was not, it was like a manual um, process um, of filtering works. Am I correct? I'm not sure if, if Meda, you, may, uh, me, Meda yes, may be one to yeah. answer that question, actually. Uh, you need to unmute yourself first, Meda. No, once more. Yes, really, I, 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 I did a manual work. 
I refined in errata, I search, and um, the result, it was 1,000 titles. Mm -hmm. So technically, it would be possible to automatically harvest things, for instance, if all the architecture books were, were part of one data set in the, uh, in the Open Archive Initiative thing, we could just have like, get that, uh, gotten the data set. We just needed the URL of the original AAAF manifest in order for, for this to work. Um, one note though, on, the, on the graph project, uh, I rely heavily on the AAAF image API uh, for image delivery and image representation, but uh, I don't use AAAF annotations actually, even if it looks like it is, but it's actually not the standard, it's re-implemented completely behind the scene um, because we, like, um, it was not giving us the flexibility we wanted to have. Uh, in order to have like the like the the viewer when you can navigate between the two and if you click on one they change the page on the other and so on and so forth. Uh, if you would want to do that with Mirador, you would really need to hack into the system completely to get that kind of behavior. So uh, so a lot of it was actually re-implemented. So it's not Mirador; it's just like a re-implemented triple A viewer that I'd made for that project. Thank you for sharing this experience. And uh, I think there is still a way to go in terms of um, uh, interoperability of, as you said, me uh, mentioned. Um, it was very nice to see how uh, when Annabelle uh, zoomed into the hair ribbons of, um, of the search results of the annotations. But uh, of course, if um, also, uh, I mean, things evolve. Um, now we we have seen this works only in Mirador 2, and we're maybe in summer on the AAAF World um, Conference, something new will show up. We'll see. Um, additionally, I want to say um, um, you can handle uh, audio and visual materials um, from the um, AAAF uh, version 3 and it's very powerful too and I think it's very important um, for uh, the project um, where you want to um, manage the audio visual materials um, and maybe um, you can use uh, um, some videos or um, audio material and you can combine with the uh, Wikidata and it could be very nice in future. Are there any more questions from the floor or comments? I think you can also join some challenges Elias has suggested, right? During the hackathon. If I'm not wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, um, together with colleagues, we I suggested to work on um, on uh, topography of Zurich through time, Zurich in time lapse. Uh, it's quite challenging. So uh, in the first sight, it's not connected to AAAF. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see how uh, things evolve uh, tomorrow morning. I'm very excited about it. We already have 22 challenges suggested so far which is quite a lot. And the, there are some similarities, but they're very, um, very nice and uh, good challenges. Um, I'm very much looking forward for the two days. So are we. If there aren't, oh, I see some messages in the chat. I am actually right now uh, collecting all the links you 
are sharing in the chat and creating a document which will also be in the hackathon google drive folder um, i will also share it in the slack uh, later today so all these links you guys are sharing in the chat will be kept in one place and you can have a look afterwards when you feel inspired or want to be inspired uh, it is five o'clock which gives me the permission to share my screen again. Thank you so much for your presentation, Elias, Annabelle, and Obutake. Uh, I do need to, sh ah, well, let's do it like this. So you, this is actually the sheet I just created, but we go back to the presentation and we actually have a break now for 15 minutes. Uh, we have now had two, four wonderful talks and two hours of listening and engaging. So everybody deserves a break. And also people who want to join just for the panel discussion later are very welcome to join us in 15 minutes. Have a drink. It is five o'clock. Definitely time for a beer or a Prosecco or a glass of wine if you feel like it, uh, or a tea, of course, I'm not judging. And uh, we have here, look at that, a wonderful screensaver for the next 15 minutes. I see you everyone back in 15 minutes, I guess. <laughs>